Hi, I'm Frank Olhurst with Peerless. Today I have an uh, expert with me on some security topics that we should be talking about out in the security community. And that really comes around from the ideology of SQL injection, that it's still a thing. My guest today is Michael Sabo from DB Networks. Michael, how are you doing today? Doing great, Frank. Thanks for your time. Oh, thank you for your time. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and always a pleasure to find out what's going on out in the uh, realm of IT security, the often overlooked elements that kind of, you know, haunt us. And <laughs> That's right. Bait our systems. Um, now, SQL injection, I mean, we've all heard the term. We sure. all kind of know what it is. And some are wondering out there, is it still a thing? Oh, it very much is still a thing. Um, the entire you know database security area uh, that's that's what the hackers are actually after where the data is right so they're they're getting through the perimeter but what they're after are what we call the crown jewels they're after the data in the database be it uh, PII personal identif uh, identifiable information or it could be intellectual property or even state secrets for that matter uh, but that's what they're really after so um, so when they're breaking into these databases, what they're really, when they're stealing credit card information and personal information, the idea that people have to think as those defending against breaches is that they're really after the data which is in a database. It's not so much as breaking in to gain access. It's really delving into getting that data. That's right. That's exactly true. Frank, it occurs to me maybe we should uh, just give a quick uh, overview so uh, those maybe not familiar with the thread, um, we've got a really quick uh, uh, explanation that was actually on, um, it was given by a gentleman, uh, unfortunately, uh, he goes by the handle of Michael G, uh, so I'll credit him with this, but uh, I think it's really a, an excellent description to really, uh, you know, get your arms around what SQL injection is as an, an analogy. Um, the, the, the thing is, you know, you, you get a traffic ticket and you have to go to a uh, traffic court. And the process there, when you when you uh, arrive, is you have to put your, your name, your first name and last name, and then they'll call you when, when your time is, um, when, when they're ready for you. So uh, an analogy of a SQL injection attack, I would uh, show up, I put in uh, first name Michael, last name Sabo, comma, you are now free to go. So what I've done is I've injected an instruction. So when my time comes up, the, the, uh, the judge calls uh, Michael, Sabo, you are now free to go. And so the, the bailiff, taking that as an instruction rather than a data entry, comes over and walks me out a free person. So it's kind of a silly analogy, but that, that's basically what the strategy is because SQL cannot uh, discern uh, often between data and instruction. So what they're doing is they're injecting a fragment of an instruction into a data field that will eventually, hopefully, from their perspective, get executed. So that's essentially what the threat is. And it's been around since SQL was created. Uh, SQL doesn't have strong data typing, and that's why it's susceptible uh, to that sort of attack. It's more of a conversational language. So um, it, the, the basic, um, how it was designed is why it's um, vulnerable to that sort of attack. And the reason that it, that it keeps getting worse uh, is or, or, um, in the news more and the, and the effects of it become um, greater are because of some things that's happened just over the last few years. So originally with SQL injection, well, first you had to know a lot about SQL, uh, but the, the getting through the perimeter originally was fairly difficult. Um, what's happened, oh, there, were, there were expert hackers who knew how to do a thing called obfuscation. So they knew the attack string that they were trying to get into the system that would attack the database but because the perimeter devices were looking for those signatures, they couldn't get them through. So the, but the experts could obfuscate, so they, they change the attack string around a little bit. They put capitalization, they put spaces that they know will get normalized into the very same attack string that they intended to get through. Well, these folks, they were able to get through those perimeter devices. Well, nowadays, over the last couple of years, it's been automated. So in Metasploit, for example, you can obfuscate any attack string. And, you know, eventually, if you do enough of these, you're going to get through the perimeter defenses. And that's why you're seeing more and more of these large attacks where there's um, huge databases being dumped over a long period of time because they're getting through those perimeter defenses and directly into the database tier.
So correct me if I'm wrong, you know, SQL is kind of a misnomer here. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be a SQL database. It's just any data field that can accept any type of commands that, uh, that can be, you know, forced in there. Sure, that's the generic injection. The um, SQL injection, of course, is that the code injection into, uh, into SQL. But, of course, there's HTML injection. There's, there's a variety of different injection strategies, sure. Okay. Um, well, I mean, what are some of the best practices out there to prevent this from happening? I mean, I, I guess we can't really turn to, like, the industry as a whole to just solve this problem by recreating all databases and building security into them. I, I guess we have to look at best practices and how we can deal with these type of attacks. Well, what we're doing is we're applying machine learning and behavioral analysis in the database tier itself to find these attacks. The, the first advantage of being in the database tier looking at the traffic is it's normalized. So we're not seeing the obfuscated traffic that the perimeter uh, defenses are, trying, are looking at. Uh, once they get, get into the data tier, it's been normalized. So it looks like SQL uh, traffic if it's able to get through the application. So we do deep protocol analysis breakdown. Uh, we get a copy of every statement uh, we're not intrusive, so uh, we're on a span port or network tab. But we get a copy of all the data. We parse it out like a database management system would. Uh, we apply machine learning to understand how each individual application creates its uh, dynamic SQL, okay, SQL, uh, with, as it can, uh, has a conversation with the database. So then, after a learning process of uh, a week to two weeks, depending on how complex the application is, then we just go into um, running mode, production mode, and at that point we apply behavioral analysis techniques uh, to these uh, SQL statements, and we're looking at it from a number of different uh, dimensions. We're finding, we, we understand where the attack points could be uh, on what's called a literal boundary. That's where the, um, they, they uh, tend to attack the, um, the statement itself. Uh, and we see when a statement is, is um, created, that doesn't follow the normal behavior of that application, at which point we'll flag it as a possible attack. But it's interesting. Often, uh, when we flag it, it turns out it wasn't an attack, it was a vulnerability. So it's still critically important to them. Um, it turns out that sometimes in the normal course of using an application, that an error uh, in the way it throws, you know, uh, sends its um, SQL, um, it's flawed. And so that would be a vulnerability that could be attacked, and we'll see that ahead of the actual um, attack on it. Ooh. So they know where to go into the application and, and uh, patch it. So, so I'm kind of, a, from what I'm understanding, it's beyond the realm of someone to do uh, these type of things manually because of the volume and the, and, and the complexity behind it. Someone couldn't just sit there and go through logs and figure out whether or not a SQL injection attack is going on. Uh, no, normally what happens in that regard, Frank, is after the fact, they apply big data to the, uh, the data sets and try to find out when the first attacks actually occurred. And, um, you know, then they know how long that the hackers have been in there. But, no, it's a, it's a fool's errand to go that direction. You'd be spending a lot of time with not a lot of results. You want, what you need is real-time results to stop it in its tracks, not... As Mandian says, we're at uh, 229 days now into the average attack before it's discovered. And it's often discovered by customers or, you know, third party, uh, FBI, you know, call from them, um, not normally even insiders. So that's the state, uh, the, the, uh, the state of the situation at this moment. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, machine learning, you know, the term machine learning, AI, uh, right. intelligent heuristics, and all that, everyone is throwing those terms around nowadays saying that, you know, all oh, our security products have this, and, you know, they do this, and they do that. How effective, you know, across the industry are these machine learning techniques? Are they really giving the results that um, folks are claiming out there? Well, let me, um, uh, let me address your question uh, in two ways, Frank. First, uh, the alternatives are uh, signatures, you know, signature matching, regular expressions, that's sort of thing, whitelist, blacklist. Uh, that is, it's labor intense. Um, the other thing is, you know, you're, you're always behind the curve because you're always vulnerable to zero day threats. Uh, 
Um, we know of the, there's a group in the Army that there's 40 individuals that work around the clock, and that's all they do is create signature files. That, you know, so it's, and they still are susceptible to any zero day attack. And as we talked about at the, at the beginning of the um, discussion, Frank, recall that obfuscation can get around it anyway. So uh, we know that that's an issue, and it's just not the way to, as we go forward. So uh, the alternatives are um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, behavioral analysis, um, intelligent heuristics that, that we mentioned. Um, and, you know, they're as good as what the developers um, have created. And I can tell you, in actual field experience, what we've done is proven to be highly accurate on some some of the world's largest networks. It's finding the, the uh, needle in the haystack. Absolutely. Well, so, excellent. And and I guess as you know, you actually brought up uh, kind of uh, one of the topics before big data. I gather as companies get more and more involved in uh, big data projects, it becomes more critical for them to be able to protect those databases. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's more to lose, potentially. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, uh, so we've got artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning going into uh, different areas of the network itself. Again, we're in the data center. There's other work being done on the edge, and including in, into um, uh, endpoints. One day, Frank, what they'll be, this will be 15, 20 years maybe from now, is what uh, we're calling autonomous cybersecurity. All those smart machines that are, that are doing the cybersecurity will um, have a conversation, secure conversation among themselves, and actually be able to shut down the attack in real time. Hmm. That, that's always something that's kind of interests me. We're, you know, we're always talking about you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence being used to defend systems. Mm -hmm. How far off are we from uh, the attackers using that type of technology to attack systems? Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? Um, it's, it could potentially happen. And it may be happening now, we're just not aware of it. Um, it we know the nation states um, have some very, very, very sophisticated um, you know, attack methods. Um, if, they're, if they're not doing um, artificial intelligence as an attack vector at this point, Frank, they will be at some point. Mm. So, yeah. so I guess, uh, you know, uh, moving ahead, I, I guess our best practices kind of come down to, um, obviously, you got to protect your network at the edge, you got to protect your network internally, and I guess you have to protect it at the point of data entry. Oh, sure. Absolutely. The, um, with regards to the perimeter, it's a tough situation nowadays with the bring your own device. You know, the, is there a perimeter? There's a case to be made that um, it, it's hard to even define where the perimeter is anymore. Wow, that's a, that's a good point. All right, uh, that's about all the time that we have for today. And I want to thank you for um, giving us your opinions and uh, offering advice on how to uh, keep uh, systems more secure and also enlightening us on why SQL injection is still a thing. <laughs> Join Thanks. us. All right. Uh, take care. And if anyone's interested in uh, understanding more about SQL injection, be sure to visit our blogs over at PeerList or, you know, take a uh, little uh, visit over to dbnetworks.com to look at what they're doing to uh, combat these threats. Uh, thanks again. Thanks, Frank.